so this week has been um, hard for I believe a lot of people because obviously we're aware of what's going on in Afghanistan what's going on in Haiti and this week personally I was somewhere where um, an overdose happened and honestly, I was, I work in this field and I've seen a lot of things, but you never lose your, it's, it's just a very gut-wrenching thing to watch. And what was different about this one is one of the friends of this man who we could see that there was a lot of really desperate attempts of paramedics to revive him, which we knew would happen, because it always does. One of his friends was standing by me, and we were just sharing because it, it was frightening. And then the stretcher, or the gurney, or whatever it is that the ambulance pulls in with, was taken back away without someone on it. And I will never forget that feeling. I will never forget that feeling of there's no one on that stretcher. And the young man that was his friend just started to cry. He just started to cry and I thought, we didn't see it ending like that. We didn't see it ending like that. We were positive that all of those paramedics were gonna be able to save that life, but they weren't. So it brings me if I, if I can't get any more urgent, I, I, it just brings me to a renewed urgency that we have friends that are dying in this city at a very fast pace. Two nights ago, I get a call from a young lady that I know very well, and she's confessing to me her addiction to fentanyl. And I'm thinking, oh, I hope I see you again because so many are dying out there right now that are our peers. So I'm pretty urgent at this point. I'm very urgent at this point because hell is real and it's death is very frequent around us. And the world is having some serious crises this week. What is most troubling is the disconnect of so many Christians who are safe in their homes, safe in their churches, safe in their jobs, safely going about doing their leisurely things, going to the gym, going to Walmart, going wherever. But we are responsible for our family in Christ. And right now, if you watch even the news, you will see on the secular news one thing. But what we know from our faith family is that there are tragic and brutal killings happening to the Christians in Afghanistan and other places. We are responsible to our family. Prayer is mandated, but if you are able-bodied, there is more that is required of you to be a family, to be part of the family of God. And America has become one of the greatest mission fields in the world. I had a young woman who was brought to me this past week. She didn't know she needed help, but a family member, a close family member had sent her to me because they felt that she needed serious help and that she was unaware. So she sits down in front of me and she's fairly casual. And I asked her first if she was a Christian and she said, yes. Instantly, she said yes. I asked her if she was certain that she was going to go to heaven, and she instantly said yes. I said, you're very confident. She goes, yes, I have no doubt about that. I then asked her, why is it that you're so certain that you're going to go to heaven? What do you base that on? And she said, because I treat other people very well. I said, wow. I asked her if there was any other reason that she based that on. And she said, I've been in a Christian program, I prayed a prayer, and I treat people very well. I asked her about the cross of Jesus Christ and asked her if she understood the gospel and what role that played in her going to heaven. 
and she didn't know how to answer that. She didn't know how to tell me the gospel. She based her going to heaven all on her personal choices, all on things about her life and nothing about what Jesus did that was somehow laced in there just a little bit, but most of it was on her. So when I explained the gospel to her in detail and that it had nothing to do with her behavior, good or bad, that she was going to heaven, she was pretty shocked when she had to come to a realization that she probably wasn't going to heaven. And this is the truth about 80% of the people who get sent to me or choose to come to me. They come to me because they have some kind of internal torment. Something's going on relationally. They're in some kind of crisis. But when we break it down, their salvation is not based on the true gospel of Jesus Christ. It's based on some prayer that they prayed. Some, some religious leader has told them that they're going to heaven and they believe them. They do not base their salvation or their Christianity on a covenant with Jesus Christ that to him matches a marriage commitment in every detail. There's no other option. Daniel Kalenda, who actually took over the ministry of Reinhard Bonnke, Reinhard Bonnke is one of the greatest evangelists of all time. This is what he says. My friend, you can be saved, you can be forgiven, you can be on your way to heaven and still live for worthless things, and many Christians do. It's so easy to get caught up with the cares of life, the day-to-day -day activities, the pointless amusements, and worthless distractions that consume the days, weeks, months, and years of our lives, yet have no eternal worth. Yes, we will all give account one day, but this reckoning will not deal with individual sins already forgiven by God. Those sins are gone. No, we will give an account for the way we lived our lives as redeemed children of God, for the things we did with the time, opportunities, and resources that God put into our hands. It does matter what we do, and it does matter how we live. And in eternity, some are going to have a much greater status than others. That may sound unfair, but do you think that someone like Mother Teresa, who spent her whole life giving to the poor and sacrificing herself to others, is going to receive the same reward as a guy who spent most of his life sitting on a couch playing Xbox? That may seem unrighteous, and our God, but our God would, is a very righteous judge. Hebrews 6.10 says that God is not unjust, that he will not forget your work and the love that you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. That means it would be unrighteous for God to forget your work or lack thereof. And why is it like this? Because many are so distracted that they don't even have time to find the truth that is not being spoken in most churches today. They don't study for themselves to learn, to know the answers to very critical things that are going to shape their entire eternity. They will spend hours on social media studying fake lives, but they will not look into the Bible to study what is definitely coming their way, and they know eternity is coming. So I'm going to warn everyone who claims to speak for God. If you are someone who is not proclaiming the entire truth of the gospel, and you are telling people that they can get into heaven by praying a simple prayer, living a certain way, or being a good person, or not doing heroin, or not doing something else that they were doing, God himself says that the blood of that person will be on your hands on Judgment Day. I talked to a young man this last Friday night and he had a dream about that. He said, I had a dream about blood all over my hands and God told me, you better tell the truth about the cross or that bl my blood is on your hands. He was in a ministry. He was very scared after he heard that. I would ask those of you who are not caring to share the entire truth about the gospel, the true gospel and the cost to Jesus, to stop sharing completely, rather than set yourself up to face God and be shown on that dreadful day by him how you shared the gospel and how to get into heaven without sharing the gravity of the price paid for the sin of the people you're talking to on the cross. The one who paid for their sin is going to be your judge. 
that will be a terrible day for many who felt that their ministries were big and good this side of heaven. Don't let it happen to you. If your priority is not getting that message exactly right, and people are coming to the rest of us to get prayer, thinking they're going to heaven because of some prayer that didn't require repentance or absolute turning from sin, don't share at all because it's going to be a tremendous price for you at the end. Don't take anything more seriously than how you share the message of the cross and the price paid for sin and how a genuine believer will respond to that message in how they live their life. I hear and see far too many die tragically from consequences of sin. They never left their life of sin. And many write on social media, they talk about this. They say, oh, I'm so thankful they're now dancing with Jesus. They're now around the throne. The Bible says something different. And I know many pastors who will not preach those services because they say, I cannot in good conscience get up in front of that family and tell them their loved one is likely not in heaven. If they did not repent of their sin and turn from their wickedness, the Bible does not say that they're going to heaven. They don't get to heaven by hanging around Christians, by going to Christian ministries for a certain period of time. That does not save you. And those proclaiming that they are saved and going to heaven, but allowing them to remain in their sin are not reading the Bible. The words of Jesus contradict that they're going to heaven unless they abandon self and sin. Many have become distracted from the truth by all the lies that have invaded ministry over these last few years. Few are on the narrow road that leads to heaven. Jesus said that. Wide is the road that leads to destruction. Few are on that narrow road. Not very many are going to choose to repent of sin. Those who are still living in sin are on the wide road that leads to destruction. Make no mistake, there are very few on the narrow road that lead to heaven. So a lot of these deaths, it's very tragic for many reasons because the Bible does not support if they were still living for their sin, it does not support that they go to heaven. That's why I'm so urgent. That's why we're so desperate. That's why prayer is such a big deal. That's why we are fighting and fighting to help people understand the gospel. There's a big issue that's keeping most from what is true and doing what is required of them. Webster's Dictionary defines distraction as follows. That which diverts attention, a diversion, a diversity of direction, a detachment, a state in which attention is called to different ways, confusion, perplexity, and so on, many different words. The word used here in the Greek literally means to drag all around, to draw away, and to be driven about mentally. And often that's what a distraction can feel like. We're being drawn away from a purpose or we're not able to focus. 1 Corinthians 7.35 says that you may attend upon the Lord without distraction. Synonyms of distraction are perplexity, confusion, disturbance, disorder, dissension, tumult, derangement, madness, raving. We are drowning in a world of distractions. And moreover, the world is full of things that distract us from following God. The devil appeals to us all in different ways. He appeals to every group that is every group. And we're told that we can look better. We can do things to make ourselves seem better. We're told that it's all right to chase people for gratification. You can sign up on all these different dating sites looking for people as if they're rentals for pleasure, drugs, sex outside of marriage, meds, more meds, more meds, more meds to counter those meds. Many other unhealthy coping mechanisms are directed towards all. I see so many ministries creating so many different coping mechanisms besides the Holy Spirit, it is shocking. Even when you feel like you've accomplished something good, however, the devil will come in and remind you of something that's wrong with your marriage, your kids, your job, your social life, your sanity. These are all distractions. He'll get you coming or going, and he'll 
keep hammering you until he can take hold of you. But listen to what the Bible says about all these distractions. Martha in the Bible was distracted. Jesus had come over for dinner. There was a number of people doing a number of different things. Martha was serving. She was in the kitchen. She was busy. She was busy and she was busy and she got offended because people weren't paying attention. She let the busyness in the kitchen distract her from Jesus who was sitting right in the same room. You can read about Samson in Judges 13 to 16. What you will find is a man who had a destiny and he let his relationships distract him from his purpose. His identity was established in God. His Nazarite vow was part of who he was before birth. And it's important to remember that who you really are, your identity, will always be the point of attack from the enemy. Samson was no different. The key parts of his vow were constantly challenged by his relationships with women and specifically Delilah, who was his downfall. She continued to distract him from his identity and convinced him to give away his secret. You'll find in the Bible that there are a number of people who are distracted by relationships. Lust and sexuality is a massive distraction for many people. I would say one of the greatest. Most people that I know, especially in the recovery community, it's not even the recovery community, ministry, lust and sexuality are a tremendous distraction. David was no different. In David's story, however, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. How many of us have done that? In 2 Samuel 11, 1, the spring at the time when the kings go off to war, David sent his whole army to war. They destroyed the Ammonites and he remained in the palace. He was the king. His responsibility was to be at war with his men. Instead, he stayed at the palace. Because he was there, it created an opportunity for him to be distracted. He was up on the roof. It wasn't his first time being up on that roof. He likely had seen the things before. He knew what he would see on that roof. He sees a woman who's married to another man. In fact, that man is someone high up in his army. He got distracted. He made the situation worse. He ended up being with that woman because he got so distracted and hung up on that. And then he murdered her husband. When we get distracted and make mistakes and we're out of a position, we're somewhere we shouldn't be, we start lying, we cover up, and then rather than go to God for forgiveness and help, we try to keep secrets. I've spoken before on how deadly secrets are. You will not move forward in your kingdom calling if you're keeping secrets. Eve was in the Garden of Eden where everything was provided, everything. It was paradise. Couldn't have been any better. It was absolutely ideal in every way. Lucifer, the serpent, he was able to distract her. How? He isolated her. He lied to her and he convinced her that God wasn't telling her the truth. She got distracted. She made a mistake. It changed everything. We need community. That's what God has started Seven Bells for, is to bring safety and community around us. None of us do well when we're lost in our own heads helps us if we can at least talk about what's in our head so we know get it out of our head and have someone else put truth to it but when you're isolated and the enemy speaking to you you can get pulled away into something so destructive that it leads to absolute downfall you lose the garden the paradise she lost it all distraction comes in three basic forms there are a number of different ways that these Distractions show up, but they essentially come in three basic forms. John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. The number one way, it will distract you from your identity. Your identity will be constantly challenged because the enemy knows if he can convince you of something other than who you are in Christ, he has you off course. Number two, he likes to speed you up or slow you down. Timing is everything with God. It is critical, in fact. Often distractions come in this area because we're impatient. The enemy knows he can get us to act too soon or not soon enough out of fear or insecurity, and the wrong thing at the, the right thing at the wrong time is still the wrong thing, and the wrong, there's just many different ways to say this, but timing is everything in the kingdom. Three, he will present you a counterfeit. 
Often, right at the point of breakthrough, the enemy will try to distract us with a counterfeit. It will look like a perfect job, a perfect relationship, perfect outcome for whatever it is you're asking God for. But all of these things will also involve compromise, like dating a non-Christian, dating, uh, we've all seen this, done this, where you say this man is a Christian. We see it on Facebook and, and we see our peers doing this. We see this and we know we've done this where you know you shouldn't be with this person, but you sell and you oversell and you oversell the grasp of faith that you can in that person. Like he's wearing a cross necklace. Seriously, we see this. He says the word God. He goes to church with me, things like this. And they wouldn't have to say that if they really felt confident that we would all know this man was a true follower of Jesus. Sadly, we've all done that. But that's what the devil does. He produces a counterfeit and then we know, but we take it. Sadly, we know what we're doing. Most all of us do. And then what happens is what God was bringing is bumped to the side and you go back around that mountain. And I just hope you make it because many don't. What do you do when you're feeling distracted? Your identity is key to who you are and it needs to become your filter. It's critical that you figure out what your identity is and then cement it to your heart. Every time the enemy comes at you and tries to convince you to do something that's outside of your identity, it becomes easier to stay on track. I love the workbook. Now it's a free PDF on, um, you can actually find it on the internet, Steps to Freedom by Neil Anderson. That is such a great tool because it gives you, first of all, it's like people would always tell me, step four, I get stuck on step four. I can't get through step four. And the reason why is because there was no moral inventory absolute. There was no absolute. In faith, there is an absolute, but in the secular 12 steps, there's no real absolute. So people can't get through this step four because they don't know how to do a moral inventory based on whose morality, when God is not your higher power, whose morality are you basing it on? So this is like the most thorough and an awesome tool that does a thorough moral inventory based on the Bible. But it also gives you a really great identity in Christ blueprint. So at one point early in my walk, I had printed that out and I had it taped to my mirror because I would just be seeing that as I was, since, you know, there's very few places I stand still very often. That was one place where I could actually look at that and see that. But I would suggest that as a great tool. I order them often from um, Christian book distributors and give them to people when I do prayer ministry with them so that they can go through and knock out things that we maybe didn't catch. But it's a great way to find and secure your identity in Christ. Your identity creates a truth to combat the lies which are going to come at you constantly in this world. When the enemy lies to you and tells you things that are not true, you can go filter through this identity in Christ and you can figure out what a lie is. I often tell people what you're hearing in your head, you need to say, can I hear Jesus saying this to me? And if you can't, then either you're saying it to yourself or the enemy's saying it to you. Um, I'm not saying, at that point, I would just really check it is what I would do. If you can't hear Jesus saying it to you, I would ask someone else, where do you think this is coming from? Written notes and reminders actually work. The Bible talks about reminders throughout scripture and God got the people of Israel to build monuments frequently to remember his work. He also told them to write a vision. He initiated communion also as a way to remember him. Reminders are definitely something that works. Just out of my um, need for structure, I have, I joke about how many personalities I have, but I don't think it's actually that funny because I have a lot of things going on in my head and I don't think people, I think a lot of people I'm around get that because they have a, um, very active minds also. But for me, 
every single day, I make a post-it note of every single thing that I have going on that day. Every single day, I have that made out in advance with every single thing I'm gonna do in that day and the order I'm gonna do it in. So meeting with certain people does sometimes take longer than I expected or shorter, and I will adjust that, but I adhere to that, and if I don't get that stuff all done, I'm gonna usually stay up until I get it done, or I'm gonna kick it into the next day but I live by post-it notes. I am obsessive with structure for my own life and I have always known, been known to be an overachiever because of that, because I am always writing out my days and I direct and control my time, therefore chaos does not control me. I don't let it. I follow a list, therefore I stay on track to something because if it gets chaotic, which it often does, I can pull back into order. Social media and the entertainment industry always try to show us, do what makes you happy. They don't tell you the dangers of that and what that's gonna cause you. Proverbs 1, 10 to 14 says, it's so easy to give in to peer pressure. We all know that it is going to destroy us. We've all done things to fit in, but just remember that the sins of this world will harm you and everyone around you. And God warns us of this all the time. Read Proverbs 1, 15 to 19. Don't get involved with the lives of others who are gonna lead you away from God. It's gonna lead you to a life of sin. Look at who you're hanging around and you will see who you are becoming. Proverbs 1, 19 also warns about not going after ill-gotten gain. It's one of Satan's surest traps. It begins when he plants a suggestion that you can't live without something. Then that desire fans its own fire. It becomes an obsession at some point. Ask God for wisdom to recognize all greedy desires before they destroy you. And God will help you overcome that. He is absolutely opposed and hates greed. And be very, very careful not to become part of any ministry that values money over the eternal destiny of people. There are getting to be many of them. They sell the gospel. Do not become part of that because you will answer for that. You are also part of a message of that if you stand with them. So what you stand with, you're seen as in agreement with. If you don't want to be seen in agreement with it, don't look like you are. It is perceived as agreement by those who need to be clearly shown, told, and led by the truth. Someone needs to use courage. Someone needs to stand for Christ and what is right. Many ministries are using their flock for gain, and the price on Judgment Day is going to be shocking to those people. They are clearly operating outside of the will of God because he says what will happen. He doesn't even promise heaven to those people. It is going to be a shocking outcome. It would be better that they were brought down this side of heaven and exposed for who they were, because at least then they have an opportunity to repent. And some will, some will be brought down this side. We're seeing things happen now that we never used to see before, where God is starting to expose people in ministries for who they are. Repent before that happens. Don't go to hell. And if it's you now where you're fleecing the flock, stop. The, re the whole, how that's going to turn out for the flock and you is going to be so terrible. Stop immediately. God warns us not to partner with anyone who does not carefully lead and protect their sheep. Jesus gives many illustrations of a shepherd in the Bible and he is very, don't call yourself a shepherd if you're not protecting the sheep. Don't call yourself a pastor, a minister, a leader in a ministry. Don't call yourself one if you're fleecing your flock. If you're living off your flock, don't call yourself one. That's a predator. The price in eternity for anyone who profits from those they're expected to protect and lead is going to be terrible and don't support and serve those who do that. Read um, 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Some people think that worldliness is limited to external behavior. 
the people we associate with, the places we go, the activities we enjoy, but worldliness is also internal because it begins in the heart and is characterized by three attitudes. Lust of the flesh, which is preoccupation with gratifying physical desires. Lust of the eyes, which is craving and accumulating things, bowing to the God of materialism. And the pride of life, which is an obsession with one's status or importance. Is there anything in your life that is distracting you from God? If so, get rid of it quickly. Time is very short. I will guarantee that what drew me of all the ministry people that have approached me, and I just think it was because I had a position at one time, but of all of the ministry people that approached me, God led Tatiana to me you'll see our story we did it right before this but the thing that has always grabbed me about her and other women in this ministry is their humility is just their lack of desire to exalt self to be seen to be heard to be someone just the negating of self I they just want to be exalting Jesus, talking about Jesus, exalting Jesus, drawing near to God, lifting their sisters, serving, 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 serving. That is so incredibly attractive to me. I certainly see, you know, we all see in ministries how, how exalted leaders can get. And I just love the humility I just love humility. I love it. I just love seeing it. And I also now have seen how God shows up and speaks so intimately to those who do that. I've never seen anything like I've seen in the last year where God sends such intimate messages to us, so personal and intimate. I've never seen that before. As God's people, we have a responsibility to be good examples to those who are around us. And if we lose, lose sight of that responsibility, even for moments, we will not only lose our own path, but we will cause a lot of other people to lose theirs too if we are seen as, if we're speaking for God. We're in danger of causing other people to lose their way. In car accidents, they say distractions from inside the vehicle account for 62% of distractions reported, while distractions from outside the vehicle account for 35%. And most of us relate by being on the roads in the metro for all the external distractions, but the internal ones, those are the ones that you really have to watch out for when you look at how that person looked at me, how they talked to me, how my coworkers taking credit for what I'm doing, how competitive we get with those beside us. Um, they had this great idea, now I have to come up with a great idea, or a neighbor that makes too much noise, we become resentful, the friend that we feel is unfaithful or is now hanging around with someone else, could be an unhappy customer that's just always complaining. When these types of things happen, we have to look. Are we staying focused on Jesus? Because the point is that when we allow these things to get on the inside of us, they will cause us to sin. We become offended. And offense is an outrageous thing. It shows up on your face. It shows up in your behavior. It shows up. It, it just absolutely stops the flow of the Holy Spirit. I know that personally it will make you look like the most dead believer there is. Sin and bad attitudes are not good examples of how God wants us to be. People will not look to you as, oh, I want to be, I want that relationship with Jesus. They will not do that. It will have the opposite effect. They will be like, ugh, I don't want that. Although it may often be difficult, we have got to not let what's going on around us get on the inside of us. Matthew 6, 23 tells us, but if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Are we focused on the kingdom and God's plan or do we get sidetracked and become angry, discouraged and hopeless like the world around us? It's human nature to retaliate when someone hurts us, but it's wrong, it's wrong. As God's people, we have a responsibility to be good examples to the people that are around us and to those who are watching us. 
Hebrews 12, 1 to 2 says, we must focus on Jesus. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The opposite of distraction is focus. We must focus to keep ourselves from becoming distracted. And what does the Bible say about being focused? While it's inevitable that we will become distracted, it's very important that we remember to stay focused on God and His ways. Psalm 86, 11 says, Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Romans 12, 17 says, Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. Colossians 3, 1 to 2 says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. Where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Timothy, 1 Timothy 4.16, we're told to focus on your life and God's word. While it's inevitable that we're going to be distracted, we have to stay focused on the word. That's why it's very important that you know the word, that you re read the word, study the word for yourself. It's not being preached in very many churches to the degree that it needs to be. Be very, very careful who your spiritual leaders are and never serve one who is compromising the message of the cross of Jesus Christ. If they are neutering that message in any way, do not serve them. Do not let them be your leaders. Get under leadership that is very clear on the gospel because a lot of people's futures are riding on that. We have got to represent the truth in every way. Don't let anything let you stay tethered to a lie. The answer to overcoming spiritual distractions is all about intent. The more intentional you are when it comes to your day, the easier it's going to be to focus. Being intentional protects you from being pulled away. That's why I live by a post-it note every single day. That way you are responding from a place of truth, not from emotion all day long. Write the vision, make it plain, so he may run who reads it, Habakkuk 2.2. 2. So what are you looking at? This verse in Habakkuk gives us some insight into what it means to stay focused. The problem is that we generally look at that verse as meaning the long-term vision, but trust me, it can be for this day. Our vision is about many of us moment by moment. I do this every single day. I think that being intentional about what we actually see is part of the key to getting breakthrough in this area. The vision you have for your life is not going to happen by accident. You need to very intentionally drive your time so that you can be trusted to get where the Holy Spirit is leading you. Many people feel guilty that they don't connect with God enough and often wrestle with this, but if you can sit and troll just say Facebook for 40 minutes watching what may or may not be true, I would rather spend that time listening to like Times Square Church, my favorite for sermons. Just you have to discipline yourself to use your trolling time in a different way. Experts say that the attitude you have for the day is set in the first eight minutes of your day. So you get to set your attitude right away when you wake up. If you grumble, gripe, and grunt your way through the first eight minutes, that's probably going to be the rest of your day. If you wake up and you choose to be grateful right away, that is going to be the rest of your day. And companies are studying often factual things like this so that they can develop distractions that right away will become the thing that tap into us and pull us away. There's no question that social media was developed by geniuses, but we can also purposefully and intentionally use these things for the kingdom. So it's all about intention, mm -hmm. it's all about purpose, and it's all about discipline. And a lot of these things you can do 
again by writing out your vision even if it's per day which is what I do but it's also good to have accountability and that's why it's good to have a group around you where you can't get too far off track without somebody climbing into your business which is what we do here <laughs> if somebody isn't looking right we're going to ask them a few questions and that's probably why most of us are still up and running because we know we can't get too far off without somebody invading our space around here. The key is being able to control where you're taken to if you get distracted. So have always safe things where you can immediately turn on um, healthy things that you're listening to. Most of us have just determined that we're going to have an audio Bible playing almost everywhere we are. We're going to control our air and we just have audio Bibles playing everywhere. And now we have Tatiana praying in spirit, so we can play that too. So we also have added things to that. But you can also distract yourself into someone else's life. So we choose to do that with Breakthrough Ministries. They allow us to come down and serve with them, the homeless. So distracting yourself to serve another to make their life better is also an excellent way to be distracted is um, make your daily email reminder, find someone around you to compliment or encourage. Always be looking to another to lift them up. That's an another excellent way to be distracted. Um, looking for ways to use your gifts and talents. Lifeway has an assessment that you can Google for free. Lifeway gifts assessment. That's an excellent way to find out what your giftings and talents even are. And then it suggests ways that you will be fulfilled in filling them. So I tell people, download that. That's another free tool on the internet, Lifeway Gifts Assessment. And then you can take this little assessment and it'll help you understand what you love to do and help you find your purpose. Another simple thing is just, what would Jesus do? Live according to that. Just pay attention to what you're doing and saying and think, is this what Jesus would do? It's a very practical, it's a cliche, but it's very effective. He was often distracted by people during his day, but when he intentionally engaged these people that distracted him, there was often a miracle involved. Distraction can be a helpful way to cope with difficult things, but you have to guide that distraction. Don't let it constantly take you off course. There are a lot of verses for those who are distracted. I will just name a few, Titus 3, 3 through 7. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. 2 Timothy 1, 6 through 7, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear but of power and love and self-control. One more, Philippians 3, 13 through 14, Brothers, I do not consider them I have that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So for the sake of the direction that many people are headed, just in total deception, even in what would we would think of as a Christian community, they're just completely in error and they don't know it get on the right side by everything that you say about God or for God or about faith in general make sure that you are serving the right side because if you're not giving the right message and people are getting a neutered version of the truth you're actually serving the enemy and the price will be very great for you it is a very big deal Serve with people who are telling the truth. 
Don't align with those who are not. Don't be associated with a gospel that is not the real gospel. Precious Lord, I pray that you would help us. We all need help in this area, including myself. There is just so much out there and so many opportunities to just be careless or not clear or fear of man or just impatient, not wanting to take the time. Help us, God, to realize how serious this is. Every single person that we encounter has a heaven or hell choice to make about their life. This is the only reason we exist this side of heaven is to be ambassadors of the truth or ambassadors of a lie. Help us, Jesus. Thank you for your great mercy for us. Thank you that you are more than able to help us and to correct the mistakes that we have made. That by your spirit, you can come in and correct any deception that we may have given, but help us, Jesus, to not deliberately align for any personal reasons with what is not true about your son, Jesus. We surrender ourselves completely to you, God. Thank you for every blessing. And I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.